The Illusion of Free Will by Wim Janser, 1947-2024. It is an almost ineradicable fallacy that man is in possession of a truly free will. There is not one suggestion in the entire Word of God that man really has such a free will. Choice and will, yes, that happens. But a free, unlimited, unhindered will? It is nowhere to be found. Yet those who adhere to the teaching keep claiming that we have one. Let us take a look and see what we can find to oppose this false teaching. The term free will occurs nowhere in Scripture. That in itself should be a grave warning to us. Man is not sovereign. This means that he cannot live on his own and go about freely without the support of God's provisions and the permission of someone else. Why? Man is not his own man. He is owned by someone else. Sin, Romans 6, verses 6, 17, and 20. A slave may do a lot, but practicing a free will is not one of his liberties. It is his owner who decides what the slave does and where the limits of his freedoms lie. Should the slave decide or declare himself a free man, the master would immediately declare the rights of his ownership and would prevent this undertaking of the slave and mete out whatever punishment he decided was appropriate. The believer in Christ also has no free will. We may apply here the same principle discussed previously, albeit with another owner. We have been bought by Christ, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, and chapter 7, verse 23. We were transferred from one owner to another, but what an improvement. That we are slaves of Christ as well can clearly be seen in Paul's position. Even as early as Romans 1, verse 1, he wrote that he is a doulos, slave of his Lord. The rendering servant is too light here. Doulos really means slave in the sense of being owned by someone else. There are more places where Paul presents himself as slave. Galatians 1 verse 10, Philippians 1 verse 1, etc. He also calls other believers a slave lord. 2 Timothy 2 verse 24. We are no more than and no different from either he who wrote it or those who were being addressed. The sovereignty of God. A being who executes a truly free will will by definition affect God's sovereignty. The being is then sovereign itself, isn't it? There are sovereigns amongst people, kings and queens, for instance, who do not have to give account to men for what they do. But that is always in relation to people. In relation to God, in the execution of our will, that is different. He is the sovereign, the one who does not have to give account to anyone. He is above all and everything and even kings and queens will have to give account to him, should there be even one being which by having and exercising its own free will proved to be not subordinate to his will, then that being would be equally sovereign to God. That is impossible. The omnipotence of God, the existence of a being with a truly free will, would contradict God's omnipotence. Omnipotence means to be capable of doing anything, but also having power over all. Should any man have a free will then? By the exercise of that will, he could escape or bypass that all-encompassing power. That would contradict God's omnipotence. Prophecy. A being with a truly free will could block the outcome of prophecy. The scriptures know two kinds of prophecies, conditional and unconditional. Of the first type, exemplifying the 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, proclaims of God, who saves us and calls us with a holy calling, not in accord with our acts, but in accord with his own purpose and the grace which is given to us in Christ Jesus before times aeonian. Question. In what tense is this verb saves written? It is done in a very special tense called the aorist, a Greek form that we do not have in our languages. It means that it was once started, but it is ongoing and will continue. When was this saving started? The verse answers that too. Before aeonian times. Before time began. The saving was done before you were even in sight, yes, even before Adam was created. Whose will was mentioned here? God's. It was done in accord with his own purpose. Where do we read here of our free will and our consent and our purpose? Nowhere. Another example. Saul of Tarsus was the greatest human enemy of the Ecclesia in Israel shortly after Pentecost. He persecuted this Ecclesia in a horrible way. One day he was on his way to Damascus with the powers of the religious order of his day behind him, intent on teaching a lesson to the believers in Christ in that city. Then suddenly he is startled by a burst of light, a voice and a question. Saul falls on his face and can only say, Who are you, Lord? 
That was the turning point in the life of the man we know as Paul. Question. Where was the free will that Saul is supposed to have possessed? As the greatest opponent of Christ among mankind, he must have had the right to exercise his free will. God is not allowed to use force. Otherwise, there would have been no exercise of free will on the part of the individual. Or was that supposed free will suddenly not as free as many think it is, nor as free as it had been ten minutes before? Is a free will not able to stay free in an environment where God's Spirit is present in the full power of the glorified Christ? If not, is that free will then truly free? Where in this story do we hear God asking Saul to convert? Where does it say that Saul asked for forgiveness? Where does it say that Paul first prayed the sinner's prayer? Where in this account did God need the cooperation of man in order to achieve his goal? Not a word can be found about it. Scripture presents us with many more examples which prove that it is not man who seriously seeks for God, Romans 3 verse 11, but that it is God who seeks man. God does not use force, but God convinces, and he does that with so much conviction that no one can resist him. No, God does not force, but he urges and will successfully persuade all, for God is love.